Okay, <clears throat> in the second part of our discussion on immunosuppression, we're going to take a look at um, some of the ways that we can su um, suppress the immune response using potentially drugs. Uh, but to finish up with, on uh, HLA testing, <coughs> excuse me, um, on HLA stuff, um, I want to just point out here. Um, get, my, get this thing to work. Oh, well, I have to use this one. Uh, the use is what what one uses HLA testing for. Now, of course, the first thing that uh, we would think about is for tissue matching, um, and that makes sense. Um, there's tissue matching, and and that's what we've where we've talked about in terms of um, this is important for a transplantation uh, and just to to make sure um, you understand you want to have it usually at least uh, five of the HLAs a minimum of five of the HLAs uh, matched um, that's uh, that's usually good that means that the, the transplant transplant may um, may be able to hold fairly well um, and it depends uh, on a transplant it depends on the institution or where it's being done for it as as to the degree of the success of that um, the success of the transplantation and of the surgery uh, places like the University of Minnesota which have a tremendous amount of experience in transplants particularly kidney transplants which was almost essentially invented here uh, and as well as bone marrow transplant, um, then they might be able to uh, take patients which have less HLA may, may may not match complete, you know, as good as 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 well as others because they have a long history of dealing with those kinds of patients. But other places which have less history uh, are going to be much more conservative about wanting to do transplantation with p with matches that are as good as they can possibly get. Um, uh, HL an antigens are also associated uh, with um, uh, are also associated with some diseases. Uh, for example, if you express uh, the HLA B27, and I want to point out that the, the 27 is the polymorphism, and so there's a lot of different polymorphisms, and so you'll see these associated um, with, uh, you'll see these associated, these numbers associated with HLA. But if you have that, you have, um, eight, you're 81, 81 times more likely to be, uh, ha to be able to get uh, ankylosing spun spondylitis um, and so those patients have that so some diseases are associated actually with HLA they would be sort of immune uh, immune uh, immune based uh, autoimmune based diseases um, it's also used in paternity testing and forensic uh, forensic medicine to determine how close an individual might be uh, to the parents Of course, today we use DNA. Um, uh, years past, uh, HL testing was used um, also to determine paternity. Um, but today we use mainly DNA is, is by far more readily used. Um, the other part, fourth one, the last, not the last one, but one of the ones that's you, that's, that, that is used is for anth anthropomorphism. Uh, thermologic studies to, to track uh, ethnic groups and this is when you're looking at you can look at DNA of course to look at how well uh, how close an individual individuals are within one particular uh, group of, of, of ethnic group of ethnic of, of ethnicity uh, group of uh, within a tribe or within a particular group within a, uh, a region you can also use um, HLA testing, and this can tell you what the diversity of the immune response is, is likely to be. So, for example, in some populations, like uh, there have been studies, uh, for example, against North American, North American Native Americans, um, that there is much more closeness within their genetic. You know, there's much less genetic diversity within that population than there are in 
um, say a European population, European African population, and this may have to do with uh, how they came, um, uh, their travels into the in the North America, and then the isolation of some of the populations over many over several over thousands of years. Um, but it can tell you information about, it can also tell you information about the history of people uh, when you look at HLA, test, uh, HLA testing. Uh, it is true that the more homogeneous the population is when you're looking at uh, potential donors for transplantation, that that's a better thing. Um, and so, uh, but it, it's also, um, and, and we'll kind of touch on this um, and that a population that is rather diverse then they don't have the potential uh, is less potential to be a, a good matches for uh, as far as donors are concerned so this gets us to sort of for immunosuppression uh, when we look at the immune um, the way that our, our, our immune system is set up each individual has uh, you know six different HLA-1 alleles, excuse me, uh, HLA-1 alleles, and then there's a diversity of potential immune recognition exists within a population which is essential for protecting that population for diseases. So a highly diverse population is going to have less, uh, it will have a less chance of succumbing to potential infectious diseases. And what I mean by that is that it's not that, indivi that individuals won't get sick, and some may die, and some may be in, uh, may, there may be morbidities, but the immune system is not there just to protect you, but the diversity of that immune system is to protect the population so that the species can survive. So the more diverse that population is, the more that it it's, uh, uh, has a chance to, uh, uh, it will survive a potential infection. However, this also, this diversity is a con because for successful transplantation, you need to have at least five of the HLA, A, B, and C antigens and D, uh, DRs to be the same for uh, sexful, successful transplantation. And so, <clears throat> of course, we didn't. We weren't involved. We didn't evolve to have for transplantation. That's a completely man-made um, uh, phenomenon. Uh, nature was more concerned with our ability to survive infections. Um, and actually, even malignancies. But 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 if you go back, you know, fifty, hundred thousand years, man, uh, human beings were much more likely to die of injury or infections, and than than cancer. Cancer is something that's a, really a disease uh, of uh, of old age, uh, length of age. And so, if you're if you're the, the population's um, lifespan is only twenty five to thirty years of age, sure. which at the time of Christ, the uh, average male lifespan was about 32, 33 degrees, uh, 32 or 30, 32 years, 30 to 32 years, then um, dying of cancer is not really going to be a big, it's not as big an issue as, as, as uh, infectious diseases are. So those can be, those are, um, so our the immune diversity, again, can be a problem for transplantation and to finding those donors. Um, and uh, whereas it's a it's a great plus for us when we're fighting infections. Now, immunosuppression because of the donor that issue, then you also uh, you need to look at how we might be able to to uh, suppress uh, the immune response um, and and use uh, drug therapy to do that. Now, um, drug as as I stated er earlier, that you know, for skin grafts, it was recognized between twins that you could put, you could have grafts between twins, and they wouldn't be rejected if they were not, um, if they were two different, you know, two different individuals. Those would be rejected. You can see this with mice. You can see this with all, any kind of, with most animals. Excuse me. Um, and. Um, so it became around, um, this became kind of an issue actually um, in World War II, the war when you had people who had burn victims, you know, how you might be able to treat their, treat their, treat their burns. And one of those uh, techniques that was uh, developed was the use of skin grafts from the individual. 
so taking grafts from a person's like for example leg skin grafts and putting it on their arm or their chest or something where in that case the skin would uh, be able to grow back uh, in this case uh, <clears throat> and you wouldn't get rejected but you could but what about other organs and so the advent of this transplant transplantation therapy has really depended on drug therapy it's been totally dependent and the first drug the first actual drug that was used as a as a uh, immu um, for immunosuppression was azathioprine or imuran this was way back in 1962 and this came about um, uh, the history of this comes about in the interest of, in the development of ways of approaching cancer. And what was noticed is that when you, in the very beginning, when people started to look at cancer therapy, uh, anti-cancer therapy, that that actually originated from the development of uh, chemical warfare agents. For example, mustard, mustard. Um, um, mustards mustard gas and mustards that would be used as chemical warfare agents because what was noticed in those studies is that they also kill they also were able to kill cancer cells um, and so after the war after the war studies began to to be, be taken and that well maybe some of these compounds um, could be used now they're quite toxic and what was noticed is that as people in, in cancer is a proliferating disease so anything that would kill what was recognized that would interfere with DNA uh, potentially DNA synthesis uh, you have to remember back in 19 in 1962 uh, <clears throat> really the DNA polymerase was just being discovered um, and it was only it was less than 10 years before that was the actual double helix had been discovered so uh, it, it was started to be recognized that if you interfere with DNA production or DNA um, the DNA was important the DNA synthesis was critical for for life and that any drug any compounds that interacted and stopped that could be also anti-cancer agents it was also found that it that other tissues like the bone marrow uh, or immune cells which need to proliferate are also subject to um, these uh, compounds and can be decreased so as you go through, uh, so these were the first compounds, and immunam was one of the first ones. Uh, it was tested first on dogs in transplantation, and has and was uh, used in patients rather quickly. I think it was less than a year before, after the the dog tri trials, they did a few animal studies, and then it was FDA approved. We never see that today, um, but. Uh, uh, that led to a kind of looking at how you might be able to use, you know, the whole emergence of potentially transplantation therapy, the use of it, and by the use of immunosuppression. And so, uh, there's been several drugs, and we're going to look at some of these drugs that have been made over the last, that have been um, um, developed over the last few years. And you can see the last, but it's not a huge number. And so. Um, a number of these that are FDA approved, really the last one FDA approved was in 1998, um, in, uh, uh, Bacillus uh, Eximab, which as you can guess is an antibody. Uh, but there's been a variety of ones that have been made, some of them small molecules and some of them actually have been used as antibodies. And, but there's just, I want to get a point across is that there, there are not new ones being um, coming on the market like every year, every couple of years. It takes a long time. In fact, you can see here between use, there is almost a, um, uh, there's six years here, there's uh, seven years here for this development. Uh, and it's been, um, it's been now 10, uh, 16 years since the last one was developed. Um, so, the techniques uh, that we look at for immunosuppression, there are, when we need, we want to prevent graft rejection, um, first we need to look at matching the donors, HO has done, and, and related donors have a better survival rate. So donors that are related, uh, brothers, and if, uh, brothers and sisters and siblings, and potentially parents, uh, those donors, uh, that transplantation usually has a better chance. In principle, there are two basic approaches to immunosuppression. 
general immunosuppression where you can suppress the entire immune response and antigen specific uh, uh, suppression in which we are which we love to be able to and in some cases can get close to suppressing one part of the immune system um, and we're going to see we, we got to the point where we can suppress for example T cell maybe T cell reactions um, but that and but we can't suppress, for example, just the T cells that interact with that those uh, uh, HLAs or MHCs. So it's a general. It, in, it would be specific for T cells, but not for, for example, B cells. So that's about as close as we are getting for specific. But we'd love to be able to do this where we could we could just suppress the part um, of the immune system that recognizes that particular antigen. In practice, though, only general immunosuppression is used. Um, we can't really suppress. Uh, <clears throat> we can't really suppress uh, Im immune response to just a particular antigen yet. So, in general, right. suppress immune suppression is involves suppressing either the entire immune system or major segments of it in order to suppress the response to a limited set of organs. Um, so, for example, suppressing T cell reactions or suppressing B cell reactions. Um, but not just not just the ones that interact with that uh, that particular organ. Even used when uh, even used when uh, H um, even when you have them, you still have to use it uh, immediately after transplant. And in some cases, immunosuppression is required for uh, the rest of a patient's life. Uh, although there's evidence that uh, there is evidence that over a period of time. A patient can be tolerant, can become tolerant. Immune, uh, immune system can become tolerant to the organ over time, um, at, uh, as they're on the, as they're being immune, uh, when they've been on immunosuppression. Now, you can manipulate the immune system in many ways, and and uh, one of those ways is to remove immune cells from the donor tissue. So to prevent the uh, what's called guest versus host disease, you produce to because tissues that have uh, tissues harbor immune cells for particularly for T cells, and so they perfuse donor tissue uh, before transplant to remove blood and lymphocytes and irradiate that tissue if it contains substantial amount of lymphocytes um, and this will allow you to kill those particular cells that are uh, tumor cells that are uh, lymphocytes that are in there so for example so one of the big one of the big problems with transplantation is the lymphocytes from the donor that are in the tissue attacking uh, the host uh, the, the person who is the recipient um, and so that needs you can remove those cells potentially uh, using you need to remove those cells if you possibly can. Another one is prior prior blood transfusion. Um, this is acts by a circ by just essentially removing the blood from the patient and then putting blood back in from uh, that's been uh, donated, and that blood will have the the antibodies from that person will be removed temporarily from the from the person because you know as a transiently from the person and when they have the uh, blood transfusion. Uh, there's also total lymphoid irradiation. This involves in delivering radiation to the lymph nodes, the thymus, and spleen, while non-lymphoid organs are shielded. And much more profound emission occurs than one would expect. So this means basically radiating, um, protecting the other organs, and just just basically knocking out the whole immune system with the radiation. And that will profoundly affect the reduce the person's immune, uh, immune suppression. Of course, you would need a bone marrow transplant after that, if you, uh, in order to in order to live. Um, people who have received this kind of radiation, uh, lethal. This is would be lethal doses of radiation because, um, as was uh, shown in uh, after Hiroshima, um, uh, the when the atomic bomb was was uh, was you, the survivors of. Uh, um, Hiroshima or Chernobyl, uh, that people have that have uh, received these huge amounts of radiation, their immune systems wiped out, and they uh, die rather um, terribly of infectious diseases, unless they're given can be quickly given a bone marrow transplant. Now, <clears throat> for drug therapy, um, you 
there are sort of two class classes. The first class that we're going to look at are called cytotoxic drugs, and I, and I sort of mentioned this one here. This is azathioprine or imuran we've seen before, uh, has been the most commonly used and uh, over the over the decades. In the body, it's converted to uh, six mercaptopurine and ultimately six mercaptu purine nucleoside and what this does is it blocks uh, nucleic acid synthesis by acting as an analog of uh, anosinic acid so uh, this would be effective against it, it's effective against uh, um, proliferating tissue um, there are some limited uses of methotrexate and cyclophosphoramide, uh, cyclophosphoramide or two other cytotoxic drugs these are also anti-cancer drugs as well Mycophenolic acid is an inhibitor uh, of inosine monophosphate dehydrogenase and therefore lowers the G, uh, GMP levels in the cell and thus interfering with nucleic acid synthesis. So the way that this drug works is it lowers those pools so that you don't have enough GMP and so therefore it's hard to make, it's the raw material you need to make nucleic acids from so you don't have them and so as a consequence the cells don't survive very well. Um, there are uh, they are toxic to proliferating tissues, these compounds, particularly cancer, and act by stopping lymphocyte proliferation, perhaps by clonal N, and perhaps by clonal deletion. By You stop it, and when you've knocked out some of those immune cells, what that means is you've also deleted those cells from the, from the immune repertoire that you have, and therefore allow, and, and though you may have knocked out ones that could interact with that transplant, so you sort of you sort of at least temporarily clonally deleted them. Now some of these drugs you can see here these are their structures and I just to show you um, this is azathioprine and azo azathioprine is actually a prodrug of thioprine uh, this gets reduced off um, uh, and uh, and when it is, is when it's incorporated then in when it gets into the cells it's able to uh, be converted into the uh, riboside uh, cyclophosphoramide um, undergoes a conversion uh, by uh, hydroxylation uh, hydroxylation of the six member ring um, by CP450s to produce this phosphoramidate um, in which this in which now this mustard this uh, will form a um, will this will um, react with um, uh, react with DNA it undergoes a conversion which it uh, in which it forms reactive intermediates that react with DNA and cross-link DNA methyltrexate is a folate is an antifolate and so stops of, um, DNA production because you need a folate is necessary for DNA synthesis, DNA and some anti um, as well as some um, any amino acid synthesis. And mycophenolic acid um, here is a direct inhibitor of um, the dehydrogenase. You're not going to need to remember these structures. I just want to show you that see, these are some of the, these are what they're. Um, these are the structures in that they're small molecules that have um, that target that target proliferating tissues, among which um, immune cells are proliferating tissues. Now, the first real drug that was de uh, developed um, that appears that targeted the immune that really seemed to target the immune system are the cortigos corticosteroids and prednisone is the most commonly used it's an it's um, it's basically an, um, a prodrug uh, of hydrocortisone and cor and the way it works is it kills lymphocytes pretty selectively but the major mech uh, major mechanism may be blocking IL-1 secretion and that which activates which has a uh, activate high is activating the immune cells Corticosteroids inhibit prostaglandin synthesis and various other aspects of the immune response. And so you've seen this. This is why, you know, when you have an injury or bursitis or, or an inflammatory disease or inflammatory inf inflammation, if you, get, if you get a shot of corticosteroids, they vastly reduce the um, ability for you to produce um, these um, molecules that lead to an inflammatory response like uh, prostaglandins. 
Now, um, prednisone, the way uh, this uh, works is it, uh, this is prednisone, it is a, a steroid, as you can see here, and this story um, gets reduced to, um, reduced to pr uh, prednisolone. This is four times more potent than hydrocortisone, and so um, you can use uh, uh, hydrocortisone, but hydrocortisone, uh, you can use hydrocortisone, but what was found is that if you just reduce that one, it's right, quite remarkable actually, in terms of its, uh, if you just um, reduce uh, right here, the rain differences here and here, um, that, um, and the other differences here, here. So these two now you can see they look alike except for the fact that they don't have they they do they each have a different the this has been reduced and this is is um, uh, this double bond has been reduced and I think if I have it on here no I don't uh, and let me just put that up there again so this and this this changes the conformation and makes this four changes the conformation of the steroid and makes this four times more potent than hydrocortisone just that one change and so that's why it's used uh, so then you can use less less of it than you need to use for hydrocortisone uh, the mechanism of this um, has only recently actually within the last 15 years been determined and here's if you remember here's the signal transduction pathway for um, uh, for uh, development of um, of the immune response to production of of for example IL-1, IL-4, and IL-6 and this <coughs> in case uh, you don't recall this you have act once you have activation you can uh, get phospholipase C is activated which will act on diacylglycerol and cut it uh, this will activate uh, phosph um, protein kinase C, and protein kinase C will act on the will act on the uh, I kappa beta, and uh, what it will do is, of course, is it um, uh, phosphorylates the I kappa beta, removing it from uh, NF kappa beta, the transcription factor, which can move into the cytoplasm to, into the nuclear membrane passive nuclear membrane and then activate transcription of IL-1 and so this pathway is part of again for part of this transcription process um, and steroids can cross that membrane they're hydrophobic they can cross the membrane um, and they can bind there is a the steroid receptor uh, is bound uh, to a protein which is heat shock protein 90 in the cells uh, and this little this little blue uh, this little blue ball here means that part of the molecule is bound to HSB 90 and part of the steroid receptor is bound to HSP 90 now when it binds to uh, when it binds to when it binds to the steroid um, what happens is there's a conformational change so the this ball kind of gets deflated you might say um, there's a conformational change that releases it from HSP 90 and because HSP 90 keeps it in the cytoplasm and that can then uh, that then crosses the uh, nuclear membrane is transported and then works uh, then which can activate then uh, I kappa beta um, and so uh, and as a consequence, you get lots more of I kappa beta, this inhibitory molecule that's produced. And if you get more of this high kappa beta that's produced, what's going to happen is it's going to bind to the NF kappa beta, NF kappa B, and <clears throat> and inhibit it. And so essentially, uh, this activation, what you're trying to do is you're trying it, what the story does is it reduces the amount of NF kappa B in the long run causes it to go down by increasing the amount of um, the inhibitory complex and that happens because a steroid uh, the steroid uh, binds to the uh, receptor or the uh, steroid receptor which becomes a transcription factor which activates then the transcription of the inhibitory and the, this inhibitory molecule 
Um, and as a consequence, what you do, what happens is you get uh, a slowing down or suppression of uh, the transcription of these uh, of these cytokines, particularly IL-1. So that's how um, that mechanism uh, works. Now, uh, another class are referred to as the immunophilins, and these are drugs that act by inhibiting antigen-specific signals in T cells that are mediated by proteins that are called um, immunophilin binders. So, immunophilins. So, these are immunophilin binders, and they bind to immunophilins, and <coughs> they uh, prevent uh, IL-2 production or IL-2 receptor production or activation um, and we're going to talk about um, three of those classes um, or at least two of them and three drugs two of which do this and one of them which acts through immunophilins and, and um, carries out a different mechanism and so the first one is, is cyclosporin or sand immune this is a polypeptide um, hydrophobic cyclic polypeptide uh, is approved for prevention of rejection in kidneys, liver, and, he and, and heart transplants. Um, and it can be synergistically used with others. Um, there are <clears throat> so some, some major side effects associated with it, nephrotoxicity, hepatotoxicity, infection, lymphoma. It also raises a serum cholesterol. It's clinically, it's used uh, for a lot of different conditions um, and from organ transplant. Uh, to other types of diseases which are up, might consider autoimmune diseases to suppress, to suppress the immune response. Um, the next part one is FK506 pacrolinus um, and this is clinically is, uh, is also a, um, a very important um, immunosuppressive drug and it appears to, to, appears to be to be this to go through the same mechanism as cyclosporin. Um, it is, however, a non-peptidic uh, macrolid antibiotic, um, and it doesn't seem to have with no structural similarity to cyclosporin A, which is interesting. Um, clinically, it's used for, again, for, for a range of different conditions, including um, kidney and liver transplantation, liver transplantation, as well as other, some of the autoimmune diseases it's been um, used for, although you have to be careful with this, um, like psoriasis and, and rheumatoid arthritis. Now these two drugs, which are referred to as immunophilin binders, uh, cyclosporin and FK506, you'll notice are very different. So this, so the cyclosporin, cyclosporin is a pept is a polypeptide. You see, there's a there's an amino acid. There's peptide bonds, and so it's a cyclic peptide bond. Cyclic peptide. FK506 tacrolinus is a macrolid, and it has it's this big macrolid is a ma means it has a macrocycle, and and generally uh, that microcycle then is is made is completed by an ester bond is an ester bond or an amide bond. In this case, it's an ester bond. Uh, is uh, what defines these ki these types of macrolids, um, whereas this is a big this is a big cyclic this is a cyclic pep polypeptide. This is a macrolid or a cyclic uh, uh, is, is a cyclic organic molecule. But they're pretty complex and they're natural product they're natural products uh, that have been isolated um, that are isolated from um, bacteria and. Uh, they really have an effect. Their natural function is probably to fight off other bacteria, uh, other microorganisms, that and to as as basically chemical warfare agents uh, in the soil and tr uh, to to uh, um, suppress the growth of competing bacteria in the soil. Now, uh, in this case, these drugs act in very different. So, if we remember back. Remember back where we went through the whole activation process, and we have calmodulin and, and calcineurin. Um, and then we have, uh, remember, the uh, activation of NFAT, the transcription factor, and then it, it's um, by uh, dephosphorylation, and then its role in the transcription of IL-2.
The way that these drugs work, these drugs uh, go uh, are transported. Well, there isn't really a transporter for them. At least I don't think so. Um, but they're fairly hydrophobic. They get across the cell membrane, and they will bind. <coughs> they bind to proteins um, in, pro in two different proteins. So FK506 will bind to FK506 binding protein, FKBP. Cyclosporin will bind to cyclophilin. Um, CSF and these two it was discovered that they will they bind to specific proteins uh, that are in the that are in the uh, cell um, called called these interfilms and what they do is they bind then what's remarkable is that they then bind to calcineurin and they block calcineurin and they inhibit calcineurin and so they, um, in the context, they have to be in the context of these proteins. So they're only uh, effective if they're bound to these internal proteins, which then display them uh, as inhibitors of to calcineurin. And when, of course, they do that, they will block uh, calmodulin activation. Uh, they basically block this calmodulin activation of calcineurin, block NFAT uh, uh, activation, block NFAT transport and then ultimately transcription of IL-2. And So these are really these are pretty selective. They're actually the first selective cyclo uh, really could be called our first selective signal transduction inhibitors that were ever that were discovered in their natural products. Um, they weren't designed they were dis they were their mechanism was worked out and this was and why they have such a selective mechanism uh, was defined this way. Initially, they were discovered just to uh, give you an idea. They were discovered because when uh, they were screening these natural products for their activities, do they kill cancer cells? Not very well. Uh, do they? Uh, are they? Uh, how toxic are the cells? Not you know, not terribly toxic. Uh, someone had the good <clears throat> good idea to do an MLR reaction. Remember MLR reactions? Uh, if you uh, and it blocked the MLR reaction. So why it was able to block the uh, activation of, of the interaction of T cells and B cells and the proliferation of those cells was what led um, researchers down the path to try to figure out what, was, uh, what the mechanism was, potentially design other ones. And you can see this here, uh, how this mechanism works in more detail. This is cyclosporin and cyclophilin. And this is calcineurin. Calcineurin is actually composed of two chain. It's a heterodimer in which this red part um, is uh, calcineurin A, this B part is calcineurin B. And this is the active site here of the protein, right in here. Okay. And when cyclosporin binds to cyclophilin, it displays it. That part that's, that is solvent exposed is in the right conformation, will bind to that active site and block it. For uh, FK506, it binding pro FK506, it binds to another protein called FK506 binding protein. Notice these are two different proteins, and but it binds in the same general area. Okay, it's a different area, but it's the same different same general area, and it also blocks the active site of calcineurin uh, calcineurin by binding to this calcineurin A pocket in the context of of the of the of the heterodimeric pair heterodimeric association. So they both block the same molecule by binding to different aspects of the active site of calcineurin as displayed uh, when they're displayed by these cyclophilins. Um, rapamycin um, is another drug. It is, is also a macrolid uh, antibiotic and interestingly enough it also uh, binds to, uh, it, it's it can be used potentially uh, with FK506 or cyclo cyclosporin. So just to <clears throat> show you is that if we were to use both cyclophilin and, and FK506, um, they don't synergize. In other words, they would block the interaction of each other. Now you'd get inhibition, but you wouldn't get double the inhibition because uh, they, uh, they're they not synergistic. They don't look at, they don't interact with different parts of the pathway. Um, and so it turns out that serolinus or rapamycin can be used in combination uh, with uh, 
either cyclosporine or FK506 because the mechanism is, is, is different. And if we look at rapamycin, rapamycin has, interesting enough, is a bigger molecule. It's also a macrolid, all right? So you see this common area, you see these common, oh, sorry, you see this common, you see this common uh, set of areas in which parts of the molecule are very similar. But other parts of the molecule are quite different. Um, and so when uh, it was what was discovered is that rapamycin actually binds to FK506 binding protein. So here's the two molecules. Here's the two molecules. This is FK506 binding protein, <coughs> which is a uh, very small molecule. And incidentally, these, these immunophilins, you have micromolar amounts of these in the cell. And there's several different versions of these. Why do we have those in the cell? As it turned out, and this whole thing, uh, the discovery was through this natu these natural products, is that they're involved in protein folding. Uh, they're, they're proline isomerases. And they're involved in correcting and, and sustaining the folding of proteins, particularly large proteins, which can have difficulty in completely folding when they're produced in the cell. Um, now, if we look at FK506 and rapamycin and they're binding to FK506 binding protein, cyclosporin binds to a different immunophilin, and FK506 binds to a different immunophilin, but they bind to the same, but they bind to the same protein. It turns out rapamycin and, and FK506 bind to the same immunophilin. But what you see is is that they display different thing. They're, they're, what they display on their out on the surface, they bind to, uh, to the same pocket, an FK506 binding protein. But they display different uh, different structures. Different um, uh, d d they display different parts. They display uh, completely different structures to the on the surface of the protein. So that would be here. So they display this is different than this part that's displayed um, is displayed to the solvent or is the solvent accessible. And what was found is that <clears throat> in this context um, when FK506 binding protein is bound to rapamycin it actually binds to it now will bind to the molecule mTOR. Uh, now mTOR um, is a kinase and what it does is it is important. It's a really central uh, kinase, um, and it's activated by IL-2. And so when you have, in fact, a lot of growth receptors go through this, and so IL-2 IL-2 when the IL-2 receptor gets activated, it comes into contact with IL-2. It activates uh, P, uh, PI3 kinase, which activates mTOR, and mTOR will phosphorylate a protein called. 4E binding protein. 4E binding protein is bound, uh, can be bound, there's a good chunk of 4E binding protein um, that is bound to 4E. And 4E is really important because it initiates, it's important at the very initiation of translation. It controls, it controls translation. And so the binding of 4E uh, to the mRNA is critically important. If 4E binding protein blocks that interaction, so it controls, it's called translational control. Uh, we don't have time to go on it, but translational control is a very important area. It's it's not, it's almost as important as transcriptional control. Um, but mTOR, uh, in order to activate tran, uh, translation, um, 4E binding protein gets phosphorylated, 4E is released, and you can get further activation of translation and ribosomal activation and an increase in cell proliferation. What's remarkable is that 4E binding protein, uh, FK506 binding protein, when it's bound to rapamycin, binds and inhibits mTOR, and therefore blocks then the interact the activation of translation, initiate translation initiation. Uh, is one of the things that rapamycin does. And as a consequence, blocks the ability to produce um, uh, IL-2 and produce more of IL-2 and produce more of that receptor because you, those are proteins and in order to produce them you need to have them translated. 
So in this context, uh, rapamycin is actually a translation inhib block, an inhibitor of translation, as opposed to the other two, which are inhibiting transcription. So uh, lastly, there is a couple other ways you can suppress the immune response. Um, the first is, uh, and that's the use of antibodies. And so one of those ways to do that is to use antibodies that are uh, poly, uh, poly, um, polyclonal, like ALG and ATG, which basically will are antibodies that are produced by which the patient is um, the patient is uh, patient's blood is, for example, um, given to a horse and you raise antibodies to the T cells and to the B cells and lymphoid cells, you can use this polyclonal antibody that then act to, to uh, polyclonal antibody to give to the patient to then block temporarily those interactions between the cell. You could use antibodies to, for example, the, um, the cell surface inhibitor, the cell surface receptors, for example, OK, AKT3 is to CD3. In these cases, uh, the, what you depress is the, really the CMI response over the AMI response tends to be uh, higher, but you'll suppress the immune, uh, the overall immune response. So we could see this here if we have uh, Th1 plus Th2 cells, you've got all the uh, receptors we've talked about and TK cells are pre-K pre cells, so there's CD8 here and CD4 here. Uh, if you have anti-CD3, they're going to block both cells, both the, uh, the, t uh, the CTLs, the TK cells, and the, and the TH cells. Uh, if you had an antibody that blocked CD4, you would block just those T, the, the uh, activation, the immune response by uh, the helper cells. And for anti-T cell polyclonal antibodies, they'll basically, the polyclonals, they'll block both types of cells um, pretty non-discriminately because they're going to, they could be to any of these receptors uh, on the surface of the cell. And so you can use, and the antibodies can be used potentially as immunosuppressive. The big, it's immu for immunosuppressive theory, therapy, and they've all been investigated um, uh, uh, to a variety of, to, 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 extent uh, to a variety of extent and last in the last and last one uh, most recent one is is the antibody um, uh, basalexamab um, which is an anti uh, IL2 receptor which will bind to the IL2 receptor in blocks and it and I think it gets taken up, and so it blocks, essentially suppresses the IL-2 receptor, and so it suppresses I, the ability of IL-2s to uh, cause proliferation. And so that can, that is a, that's a way of suppressing um, um, the immune responses too. So these are a variety of ways in which you could use antibodies, essentially antibodies to the cell surface uh, receptors that help modulate that response, to modulate the immune response, as we've seen uh, up until now. So uh, we're at the end here of this segment, and here are some review questions. And so you want to go ahead and uh, and look at these questions and uh, uh, see if you can answer them. The answers are going to be on the next slide, so you might want to stop here um, and before you answer them. And this segment is done, and we're gonna I'll finish up with a shorter segment. Uh, and then uh, to finish up the immunosuppression in the next uh, in the, uh, the next uh, online video.